welcome everyone to uh, Bayou Tapestry Mapping Threats to the Louisiana Coast. Uh, thanks for being here. Let's get started. This is southern Louisiana today. And what strikes you first is how much has already been lost. Much of what you see here used to be a dense wetland covered with trees and wildlife. But now, thanks to the salty waters of a rising tide, almost everything in this image here has been rendered uninhabitable. And soon, within 10 to 15 years, most of this will likely be underwater. In fact, according to the USGS, uh, this part of the country loses about a football field's worth of land to the ocean every 100 minutes. And in total, since 1932, this part of the country has lost over 2,000 square miles. And this is becoming more and more important today as more and more people's lives are at stake. Take, for example, the town of Lafitte, oh, Lafitte, which once sat safe, nestled inland away from the dangers of the ocean. But now, Lafitte finds itself next in its path. Looking at the image here, going from right to left on the screen, you can see the impacts of the salty water as it penetrates the land, killing off a lot of these trees and wildlife that once dotted this area. And if nothing is done soon, the several thousand inhabitants of Lafitte will be forced to move up to the north. And the most striking part is that this is all happening just south of here, barely 20 miles away. Hey guys, my name is Ashwin Kumar, and I'm a product manager at Tableau on the mapping team. And I'm Jim Walseth. I'm your dev on stage today. I'm a senior software developer on the maps team. And I want to acknowledge uh, right away this article, um, which was published back in February in the New York Times. It was produced uh, after months and months of research uh, in conjunction with the Times-Picayune of New Orleans, whose offices are across the street. And they produced this uh, very uh, informative uh, piece all about what they call the drowning coast. And when I read this, and I knew we were gonna be in New Orleans, I said, man, we have got to take that and, sh and tell this story you know, here in New Orleans. You know, um, there's some great maps, but also, you know, personally, I feel like when you visit a place that the, um, it, the sweetness of the cuisine is only better if you're also aware of the bitterness of the challenges the community faces. So this is like uh, broadening your uh, awareness, hopefully. So, so how are we gonna use Tableau here today? We're gonna tell this story in several ways. In the first workbook I show you, I'm gonna talk about how would you bring awareness of this issue to the world? In a broad sense, tell the story quickly and you know, bring people's attention and then resources. Then we'll talk about, okay, now you've got people's attention, uh, government and support of the community. How do you decide then what to do? Which is really an analysis problem, spatial analysis. And finally, we'll go from the large scale to the small scale and ask how an individual community, like the one that Ashwin just spoke about, can use Tableau to make an argument for their own survival or self-determination. So, I'm gonna get started with these workbooks. So, here we have a fairly simple map in Tableau. It's in a story point format. And these orange dots with the names next to them are communities that were mentioned in this article as being at risk. Now, this image is sort of setting you up because there's nothing particularly uh, frightening about this picture. But the second story point, I know it's a little bit hard to read uh, in this print, but uh, expected 100-year flood 50 years from now with no action. So before I click on that story point, I'm gonna parse that out a little bit for you. What is a 100-year flood? Well, you know what it means. It's like, it's the big one. But it's not that vague. It's actually, uh, planners for events like this uh, describe it as having a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. And they use this in their modeling. 50 years from now, now why does that matter? Why is 50 years from now different from today? Well, this is a unique uh, combination of factors in Louisiana. Land is eroding and subsiding in southern Louisiana, and sea level is rising. So 
50 years from now using sophisticated models, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana can predict what the situation will be on the ground, as it were, during an event like that. So let's just take a look at what happens when we bring that data into the background map in the same visualization. Would you like to see that again? So I think this gets the message across. <laughs> yeah, these communities, some of them are underwater, some are in a considerable amount of water, um, and you know we've got a problem. I would like to uh, also say one thing I didn't parse in this story point was with no action. And that's really actually the main focus of this talk is that this is not a story of disaster. This is a story of uh, human action. What, what is the right action to take? What are we going to do to help uh, people at risk and communities, right? Um, this model is what the CPRA predicts will happen if no action is taken. If we do not build any levees, if we do not restore any land um, from the condition it is now, this is what we get. But that's not what we foresee as the future. Now, the future is interventions, let's protect communities and things like that, right? Um, so another place to get data is from the communities themselves. And also, to humanize this story, I want to go and look at, well, what do these places look like on the ground? So what we have on the right is this Google Street View of one of these communities that I've selected. And what I'd like you to look for is anything that would give you data about how deep the water is going to be in the next uh, inundation. OK, anybody got to throw out a number, how deep they think the water is going to be? Five feet? I think five is about right. Grand Island? Maybe, maybe. Tim? Leeville? <laughs> kind of similar to what they're thinking uh, here in Delacroix Island. So uh, what I like about this, is so many captions you could put on this, but I, uh, we don't know these people. And I cannot speak for them, but there is a number you can get from that. And you, know, you don't have to, they don't need to hear from us or the CPRA or anyone about what's coming. This is not a surprise to them. You know, they're, they're ready. And also, they are resilient. They are like, no, I am, I, yes, I know it's going to be a 10 foot flood, but I'm staying here. So I, I feel that this is an important thing to know about the people you're trying to protect is that they, you know, They've been here for however many generations, and you know they want to stay. So now, this would be a great thing, which I haven't done yet, to put out uh, on Tableau Public and socialize it, right, and let, let people know about what's going on. So maybe during conference, we'll push it out there. I don't know. We'll get some feedback on it. Um, so let's say we've done that, and now we've, we've brought awareness to uh, the world about what needs to be done. So then. We have a dare, very different uh, question to answer, and that is like, well, okay, how, how, how shall we spend millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to protect southern Louisiana? So we went about trying to answer this question. This is a big data question. Um, so if I'm the CPRA, the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority of Louisiana, um, where should I focus my efforts? You might say, well, let's focus our efforts where most of the people are. Um, New Orleans, for example. Well, New Orleans, <clears throat> let me just go back to the uh, flood here. This is probably instructive. New Orleans is actually well protected. The, the model shows us dry in this event, even 50 years from now. So, yeah, there's a lot of people there, but there's no water in the scenario. So, okay, it's about water. So I'll go where the water's really deep. Some of these places, 40 feet deep. But actually, when you go to those places, there's, nobody's there. There's no buildings. So what we need is the intersection of water, deep damaging water, and lots of structures where people are. So what we found was a data set uh, of all the buildings in the United States. And using some data preparation, we 
narrowed that down to buildings in southern Louisiana. And then we took this same flood data, which is actually a shapefile that you can just download from the CPRA, and we did uh, what is called a spatial join. So this is a new feature in Tableau, but what this join, like all joins did, is it brought the properties of the shapefile, the depth of the water, and applied it to the locations where all these buildings were. And what we had were 500,000 points that were all known structures uh, and the depth of water expected there. But how do you look at 500,000 points? Anybody else know a new feature that would be good for that, looking at a lot of points and watching anything? Heat maps. Thank you, sir. I'd give you a prize if I had one. Um, heat map or, or density mark type. So that's what we did. Um, uh, I'm preparing you to, for this workbook. You're going to look at it in a moment. We created that density mark, the intersection of places and water depth. And then we took the structures that the CPRA plans to build and we overlaid those on top. So let's see what that looks like. So here we have the density mark type. Everywhere you see a dense blue area, think lots of water and lots of buildings. And there is a, uh, the red and yellow uh, lines are levees that the CPR play, CPRA plans to build. And it is gratifying <laughs> to see, particularly um, down here, this is the community of Hauma. By the way, these values you're seeing are actual depths at each of the points. You can still get values from the points when it's in a, a density mark type. This area of Hauma and this bayou of uh, La Fourche are, you know, there's a great correlation. So this is actually great. Um, I, I think that we, through our own independent analysis, sort of like validated the decisions that the CPRA has made. Um, sort of like we validated each other. <laughs> it looks like our idea was in line with what they already planned to do. And of course, they've been at this for a while, so it's not too surprising. But there's a problem. If you are uh, living, say, around here, notice that there are no structures planned. And this little kind of S-shaped area here uh, that is a, a dense, spot is the town of Lafitte. And Lafitte uh, has no levee being built around it. So this then is the next question we want to answer. Like if you're in Lafitte, um, how do you make the argument? How can you use Tableau to like say, I'm gonna make an economic argument for the preservation of this town and the building of a levee? And to make that uh, presentation, I'm gonna hand it back over to Ashwin. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. So with the town of Lafitte, the best place to start is a few years ago. What I've got here is a, a dashboard that shows the 2012 CPRA plan to build a levee around this town. In this viz here, we can see the orange line shows where the levee was planned to be built in 2012. And all of these dots on the inside each represent an individual building, a building footprint inside the town. With this model here, according to the CPRA's flood modeling, in the event of the 100-year flood, Lafitte would actually have been protected. And that's awesome. However, as Jim showed in 2017, this levy was actually struck from the plan. So in the event of the flood, in that case, here's what the town would look like. Underwater. So now imagine if I work for the town of Lafitte and I want to start putting together an argument to the CPRA to say, here is why my town should be protected. One place to start could be with the numbers, with the finances, right? So what I've got here is a dashboard that is made up of two parts. On the left is a bar chart that shows approximate uh, dollar values of the structures in the town. And on the right is that map that we just saw before that shows the 2012 CPRA plan for the levy. And one cool thing that I can do with this dashboard here is I can select different parts of this map on the right 
and I can see the dollar value of the structures that I selected highlight on the left, which is what's called proportional brushing. Now in this case, with that small square that I selected at the top, we can see that I selected about you know, $100 million worth of structures, which is about a quarter of the total dollar value of the structures in the town. Now the whole point of this kind of analysis is to get us started on the first step. Right, maybe there's a way here where we can't get enough funding to build a structure around the entire town, but what if there was a certain spot where we had extremely expensive buildings? We could pull all of our folks back in that section of town and get funding to protect that area of the town. Who knows, right? I don't know. But the point is, with this kind of viz, we're now empowered to ask these kind of detailed questions and model out these kind of what-if scenarios. Cool. Um, so overall, in the first part of our talk, we started off with the big picture story. We talked about what the problem is and how widespread it might be in Louisiana. Then Jim showed a viz of a heat map that showed the intersection of building concentrations and depth of water to give us a scale of where the biggest problems may be. And then finally, we walked through the town of Lafitte and talked about how they might get started off by making that data-driven argument for their own preservation. In the second half of this talk, we'll go through how we built each one of these dashboards. And overall, in summary, they were each made with two simple steps. The first step was the data sourcing and data preparation, and the second step was building the viz in Tableau. So we're gonna go back and forth and show how it's done. Jim? Thanks, Ashwin. Yeah, I'm gonna take the role of the preparer of the data, which is probably fair since I did some of that uh, in preparation for this. Um, and we're gonna switch back to, uh, for that purpose, to, the, to this guy. So. In the first workbook, uh, our persuasion piece, we had cities in the marks layer and we had a background map uh, with, with flood data in it. Um, what I did, this is kind of like perhaps the simplest form of uh, data that you can create. Uh, these, a lot of these small communities are not in our geocoding database, so you would not be able to just, you know, create, uh, take a spreadsheet with these towns and state and have them appear on the map. And for that reason, we needed to provide our own latitude and longitude values as, uh, as columns. I did that by looking them up in Wikipedia and copying the latitude longitude values out and putting them in my data source. Similarly, another manual operation, I visited each of these towns uh, in Google uh, Maps, thank you Google, and uh, captured uh, as a share the link to, these, to those uh, street views. So, so that's the work, very uh, simple work, really, to prepare uh, the marks layer. And at this moment, I'll, I'll just kind of give you my mini uh, architectural talk about how maps are created in Tableau. Always, there is a layer which is your data. We, uh, they make what we call marks. I, I also might call it the foreground. This is the interactive part of your map. You can select them, click on them, and things like that. There is almost always, in addition, a background map um, which was very important in this uh, visualization, but it's static and you, uh, it's there for context. And I think when you're designing yourself a map, you ought to always think about that part, uh, that you have the option uh, to put your data in the background or in the foreground, and if you don't need to interact with it, it may be better to put it in the background. Certainly for this viz, I did not want this huge shape file in my foreground, people clicking on it and performance issues and everything else. So. So what did I do with this? Uh, it's gonna go somewhere, hang on. So let's talk about that shapefile. This is the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority website. Um, I cannot uh, thank them enough for the quality of their data, uh, the democratization of the data. You can go to their site and download not only their, uh, this, this very, uh, elaborate uh, predictions and models, the data for the, for the floodplains. Uh, again, to be a little bit explicit about what this is, these, they, they created or established a polygon uh, that represented similar, a similar area, similar elevation, things like that, all across southern Louisiana, ha and it made this complete mesh that covered the whole area. And then they modeled how deep the water would be for every one of those. So every polygon in this data set has a whole bunch of values for water depth depending on different scenarios. So that, it's a very well curated, totally free, publicly available data set, which made everything we did here possible. So thank you to them. And also, you know, th this is kind of the, the future, right? The democratization of data. You can find a lot of data like this now. 
what we're showing is more like, okay, now let's democratize the tool so that people in places like Lafitte can actually use this data to do something with it. And that's where Tableau comes in. Um, so, um, next slide. So, <clears throat> now I'm going to do a little hand waving thing here. I'm going to talk about how I created that background map. Was anybody in my talk yesterday? No. Too bad. You missed it. It only happens once. But uh, I gave a talk yesterday on how to create, ex you know, in detail how I created these background maps in Mapbox Studio. You can download that workbook. It has every step in it. But, uh, so this is going to be uh, sort of brief, but to, to put data in, a data in a layer in your background map in Mapbox, you basically need to upload the data to Mapbox, and they create what's called a tile set. And th this is kind of a meaningless picture to you if you haven't been in there, but these, this shows the tile sets that were created. Um, it was actually the Louisiana coast, uh, political boundary of Louisiana, which was in the image there as a line. And then there's these master plan uh, flood depths, the shape files. Um, and once they were uh, in there, I was able to style them, make the color, uh, the color of the ocean, and set the opacity. I used the uh, depth. Oh, maybe I have that image, just a second. Okay, here we go, yeah. Um, there's a lot going on here, but this is basically like uh, the core of the styling of that data. Uh, that thing that catches your eye that looks like a ramp up at the top, Fill opacity, so um, you can, you know, basically like run. You're running like a little program in, in Mapbox. It basically says uh, when the water depth is zero, I want this uh, these polygons to be completely transparent, and that's how we get the effect that shows deeper and shallower water. Um, but I did feel like I made an artistic decision here that when the water gets to be eight feet deep, then that's, you know, you're underwater. And so then everything from eight feet deep on out to 44 feet is all the same color. So um, th that, that is a remarkably easy to do in Mapbox, uh, and I encourage you to you know, give it a try and also just think about it when you've got data, maybe it should be in the background. So that's what we did. And so that's, those were the two like, data prep things I did to make that biz possible. And then I like, handed it off to Ashwin and you know, said, go forth and make, make a biz. Here. It's this one. Cool. Um, so now let's walk through how we built this first viz that Jim shared in the beginning. So again, as Jim mentioned, um, this map here is just two parts. It's the foreground, which is the city's data, and the background, which is that colorful map that you see there. Let's build it. So I'm gonna go to the bottom of the screen here and just open up a brand new worksheet by clicking the new worksheet button. And luckily for me, Jim did such a good job with, the, with a job with the data prep that my job is super easy. I'll go to the left side of the view in the measures pane and find the latitude and longitude pills. If you recall, these are the same pills that Jim put in that custom Excel data set. So what I'll do is just double click each one of these pills. And Tableau automatically knows that it should make a map. Now, this isn't quite right because we can see that this only has kind of one point there, but we know that we had you know, six or seven cities in the data set. So to break those apart, I'll go to the top left part of the view and grab the city name, and I'll put that onto detail. So Tableau has now just broken apart that one mark into individual cities for me. Now, I'm not familiar with the geography, so I might want city labels on there, so that's super easy to do as well. I can grab that same city pill from the top left corner of the screen and put that onto label in the marks card. Cool. And that kind of takes care of those foreground marks that Jim was talking about. Now for the background. So Jim made that beautiful map in Mapbox Studio, but how do I get that into Tableau? It's super simple. So in Mapbox Studio, there's actually a native integration point with Tableau. You can simply copy and paste a URL from Mapbox Studio and bring it into Tableau. Here's how you do it. If we go to the top of the screen, there's a place called Map. We'll click it, go to Background Maps, and Map Services. Now here, I'm able to go and add a Mapbox map. Now I'm not gonna do that now because Jim has already done that for me, but again, all I would have to do here is just copy and paste a URL 
my Mapbox map is now in Tableau. So I'm gonna close this really fast, and I'm gonna go ahead to the top of the screen again, background maps, and I'll select the map that we wanna show. In this case, that first map was Louisiana now, so I'll choose the one that's called now. Great, and the background map is in Tableau just like that. Now these points are kinda hard to see, so maybe I'll change the color and the size of them. That's also very easy in Tableau. We'll go to the marks card on the left side of the screen and click color and make them orange and maybe make the size a bit bigger so they're easier to see for the folks in the back. We'll just drag a slider to do that. So now we have this map that shows all the cities in New Orleans on top of this background map that shows Louisiana today. Sorry, cities in the state on this background map that shows Louisiana today. Now, the second story point in that initial story that Jim was sharing was the same set of cities, but with a new background map, this time with the potential flooding that could, that could hit this part of the country. So making this is, again, very easy. And actually, I forgot a step here. Um, one good best practice in Tableau is to name those worksheets with descriptive names. So if you look at the bottom of the screen where it says Sheet 3, I'm going to rename that. I'll just right-click the title, and I'll click Rename, and I'll call it Now. Cool. So now, to make that new map that has the potential flooding impacts of Louisiana, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and duplicate this sheet, because what I want is to have the foreground, the cities, stay the same, and the background change. So to do that, I'll just right-click on that sheet name that I just did, and click Duplicate. Cool. So we can see that this is the exact same map that we had before. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and swap out that background map. And again, that is another map box map that Jim created for me and brought into Tableau. So it's already here in my map options. I'll just click on the right map. In this case, it's this one. And it loads in. So now we have this map that shows all the same cities and the potential flooding that could hit this part of the country. Now, the third thing that we had in this story here was a dashboard that connected this map of Louisiana today with the internet, with Google Streets. Doing that is very easy in Tableau. We'll go down to the bottom of the screen and click New Dashboard. What we're gonna wanna do is drag the map of Louisiana now onto one side of the view, and we'll drag what's called a dashboard object, or a web object, onto the dashboard as well. Here you can find those in the bottom left corner of the screen in the objects section. There's one here called web page. We'll take that, and we'll drag it onto the right side of the view. And then here, we'll just select the sheet name. Cool. Now we're at the point where we need to tell Tableau to connect that map on the left with the internet on the right. And the key to doing that is making sure that Tableau knows about those Google Street View URLs that Jim put in the Excel data set. So let's go back and make that happen. If we return to that now map that we just made, the key is to have that Street View URL somewhere on the viz. Now in this case, I don't wanna have that long string uh, blocking my map, so I'll just put it hidden in the background. And the way I do that, is by taking the street view pill from the top left corner of the screen and putting that onto detail. So now it's kind of on my viz without actually being on my viz. So now we'll go back to the dashboard that I just made by clicking in the bottom of the screen. And we'll use the dashboard action. To find that, we go to the top left corner of the screen and click dashboard. Then we'll go to the near the bottom of the menu and click actions add action, in this case, a go to URL action. So this dialog looks kind of intimidating, but it's really not. In the top of the screen, we select the source sheet. This is the sheet that I click on to drive some sort of web page action. In this case, there's only one sheet, it's the map of Louisiana now, so that part's okay. I'll change the action to be run whenever I select a mark. And then in the bottom part of the action, I'll select that Street View URL, and I'm done. So now, whenever I click on any one of these cities in the view, 
Tableau knows to query the right URL to bring that street view into the viz. Now the last step here is for consumption. Let's put all these in a nice, neat story point slideshow. Again, that's very easy in Tableau. We'll go to the bottom of the screen and click the new story button. And then we'll simply drag out each one of the workbooks that we just made. So I'll take now, put it on the screen. In the top left, I'll click blank to add a new story point. I'll drag the second one that I did not rename and bring it onto the screen. And finally, the third one and bring it on the screen. Now from here, there's of course more I could do in terms of making the formatting look a little bit nicer or adding captions to these boxes at the top of the screen. But for the sake of time, I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'll pass it back to Jim, talk about the next example. Awesome, thank you, Ashwin. Um, yeah, so uh, again, after we've done this socialization of our, we created this uh, workbook and socialized our issue, remember the next thing we need to do is go to a big data analysis of flooding and structures. So um, we set out looking for uh, how do we determine where buildings are. Uh, as soon as I started looking at that, uh, my coworker, Ryan Whitley, who's sitting here, told me that Microsoft had just released building footprints for the entire United States using, um, I'll show you there. So this is the uh, sort of landing page for that project. What Microsoft did using, you know, you can see, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, et cetera, they took aerial imagery for the entire United States and generated building footprints from it. Um, it's, this is raw spatial data. All that's, the only properties of these objects is just like the corners of the building. Uh, and I emphasize that because, um, you know, we, if we want to do analysis, this is where the join comes in. We, we need to join these, you know, shapes with the flood data uh, to give these buildings uh, that flood depth information. Uh, but I also knew that our spatial join works right now with polygons, which we have, the flood data, and points. Well, these buildings are not points. So I needed to do a number of uh, uh, operations on this data spatial operations to make it into what I wanted. One thing, for sure, was turning it into uh, points. So, so here are just summarized, and don't try to like write this down or read this, it's all gonna be in this uh, PowerPoint you can download. But there were several problems, one of which I mentioned uh, about the points. Also, there was a problem of size. So uh, just the buildings of Louisiana uh, we're 500, meg uh, 500 megabytes. So this is just a lot of data for any uh, GIS type tool to deal with. So also knowing that I wanted to do some spatial operations, I loaded this data into SQL Server. Why SQL Server? Because that is the database right now today that you can connect to with Tableau and get spatial data out. Um, I did, you can see, um, See if I can, uh, oh, never mind. Um, there's a bolded area in step one. It says it's a sort of clip source. In this step, I removed most of the buildings in Louisiana, the ones that were north of the floodplain area. So there, again, this was a reductive process, getting these down to a smaller size. Once the data was in SQL Server, I used a Tableau feature, custom SQL. And this is actually the SQL command. I am not a SQL person. I'm just gonna put that right out there. If I did this, you can do it. Um, but uh, the bolded area down there, envelope center. This is a spatial operation that SQL, the database, knows how to do. And we take advantage of that by calling that function in the custom SQL. And so what comes to us is a point, which is what I needed. Uh, I also did some other things. Uh, I, some of the data was, had problems. Uh, if you know about, you know, we can have self-intersections, polygons that were illegal for us to work with. Uh, uh, make valid command, clean those up. Uh, I also found that the order of the polygons was backwards from what we expect. So there's something called reorient objects. So um, by the time the database 
called all these uh, uh, operations against the, the, um, the data, against the buildings, I had what I wanted, which were, were just the points, a point for every building in southern Louisiana. Um, let's see. What else, did we, what else do you need, Ashwin? We got the data, we got the, oh, uh, yeah, we, had, we already had the, uh, the, the shape files, the flood data. That's what we used for the background map. That same shape file is what we need, needed to use to do, um, to do the join. So actually, this is just uh, um, an image showing there is the uh, custom SQL. There is also, in the uh, final version of this, a union. I also needed to bring in those levies uh, into the database. So uh, I just combined the levy data, which are those lines, uh, with these points. Um, and then at the top, you can see the join. There are two joins here. One is, uh, this is the spatial join, joining the points to the polygons, thus giving the points uh, the properties of the flood, essentially. And I also joined a table, very nicely curated data from the CPRA that had information about those uh, levies so that we could see what stage they're at and things like that. So uh, once this process was done, and these are, some, these are some lengthy processes, I mean, these take many minutes to run, and we certainly didn't want to have you sit through that. So this was all done, and then I did, which I do recommend, creating an extract. So that is what we have to work with after all this was done. So you can see <laughs> the data prep jumped uh, into sort of an advanced uh, level when we went to do large spatial analysis. Now that's what we had to do to tell the story. So I think, Ashwin, now you have the data you need to uh, create that workbook. Am I, right? I do, yeah, let, yeah let's right. hop into awesome. it. This one's this guy. It's possible to push the wrong button. Are you there? Oh, I go. Okay, hang on. We'll get you there. That's the one. Okay, got it. All right. All right. So luckily, using Tableau is easier than <laughs> using this thing down here. Um, so let's build this view together. So what we've actually got here is two sets of spatial data layered on top of each other. In this case, one layer is going to be those red and yellow levees that you see. The other layer is the heat map that shows the intersection of the building concentrations and the water depths. So let's open up a brand new worksheet and make it happen. So again, I'll go to the bottom of the screen and click the new worksheet button. And I want to make a map. Now in this case, we have a ton of different things to choose from. So I'm going to look for, this might actually be the wrong data set. Yeah. Don't no worries, that. let's go back. <laughs> so I'm actually just going to clear out this worksheet and we'll do it from scratch. So. Here, if we go to the left side of the screen in the measures area, we can see the data that Jim brought into Tableau for me. In particular, we have one field called point geom. Let's bring that in by double clicking. And this is the one um, that Jim made from SQL Server. This is essentially the intersection of those building footprints or those building locations and the water depth. And in this case, um, as we saw before, the best way to visualize this would be via a heat map. So let's make that. Uh, doing that is super easy. We can just go to the marks card here, hit the drop down, and click density. And Tableau is going to recompute that for a little bit. Now, one thing that I'm going to want to do is uh, go up to the top of the screen, hit analysis, and disaggregate the measures. This is going to tell Tableau to break apart all the points. Now, finally, I want to get some color on there. So I'll find the specific, uh, so these are all in the left side of the screen here. These are all different models by the CPRA to show in the event of a low, medium, or high flood situation what the depths might look like. So in this case, I will choose the medium model, which is FWOA medium 7, and I'll put that on the color. And we'll let it compute. Cool. 
So now the next step is to get that other layer that has the potential levies into Tableau. To do that, I'll go to the rows shelf at the top of the screen, and I'll just duplicate this latitude pill. On Mac, I'm just gonna hold down Command, and I'll click and drag to make that happen. So what Tableau's gonna do, it's gonna make two different sets of marks cards here. One is gonna be for the top map, and one is gonna be for the other map. Now on this bottom map, I'm gonna take off the fields that I've got right now. We'll give a sec here to compute. And then I'm gonna wanna add on the building levies that Jim brought for me into Tableau. In this case, I can find those again in the measures portion on the left side of the screen under line geom. That's what Jim called it when he wrote his query. So I'll take that and I'll put that onto detail in this bottom marks card. And we'll let it draw for a sec. Cool. Now, this doesn't quite look like what we want, and that's because the mark type for this bottom map is density. But we want it to be something else. So we'll go to the drop down and we'll change it to be a line, and we'll see if that works for us. That's okay, but it's not quite what we want. <laughs> Maybe it's automatic. So in this case, this is a great example of how Tableau sometimes knows what to do automatically. So in this case, when I'm not sure what exactly the data has, it might be a good uh, place to start to just click automatic and let Tableau show me what it thinks I should do. Now the last step that we saw before was to introduce some color into each of these levies. In particular, the color here represents the different phase of the levy, whether it's in planning mode, under construction, or already finished. To do that, I'll go to the top left corner of the screen and take the phase pill and put that to color. And now Tableau is gonna color each one of those lines in the bottom part of the map according to the phase of the building. We're almost done, guys. Now we wanna layer these two maps on top of each other into one view. Doing that is as simple as a few clicks in Tableau. I'll go to the rows shelf and click the drop down and click dual axis. In the Tableau UI, dual axis is what we call layers. So the viz is gonna compute here and in just a second, it'll put them together and layer the building, uh, the levees on top of the building footprint and water depth heat map. And just like that, I think we're done, Jim. Done with that one. Nice mm -hmm. job, Ashwin. Thank you. Um, in our last workbook, really, uh, I, didn't, I learned so much about spatial data prep, creating the second workbook, that the third one was really pretty easy. Um, see if I can swap here. Hang on. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, um, I really used the same techniques uh, to create the data. The data for uh, Jean Lafitte was uh, building footprints again in this case. I used custom SQL again. Uh, but sorry, missed, that's a little bit more detail on those joins. Um, all I really did in a custom SQL here was clip, use this actual uh, polygon for the levy in a, uh, in a uh, intersection operation in my custom SQL. And that way I cleared out all the buildings except for the ones I wanted. In this case, we did not turn it into points because we really wanted to be able to see the building footprints. So um, I also, you saw different uh, stages of flood. You saw the 2012 flood data. Again, that's really great. The CPRA, you know, has historic data. And that's why we were able to create a background map that showed the 2012 projections. That was the same kind of operation, it was another, each of those was another custom map and map box that I just went in, modified the background map with different data, saved it as a different map name, and that is what's in use in there. So um, same building data, slightly different uh, uh, preparation, bringing it in, and then some more map box uh, custom background maps. And uh, I also did a little bit of like, as far as like the values associated with the buildings, I call those uh, Wally dollars. Wally was like a nickname of mine. Uh, so you can't take those too seriously. I did a little bit of analysis 
uh, on the prices of homes in Jean Lafitte versus their size and uh, you know, correlation and came up with uh, those numbers. So, you know, don't take that to the bank with you, as it were. Uh, but that's pretty much, uh, that. Would, those are the raw materials for this. And uh, back to you, Ashwin. For, cool. Let's see. All right, let's swap this back. No. No? It's like... Uh, here we, there we go. go. Okay. Okay. So just as a refresher, this is the view that we're going to want to build. On the left side is that bar chart that shows the value of the structures in Jean Lafitte or in Lafitte. And on the right side is a map that shows the potential levy that was going to be built and all the building footprints. And finally, we have a selection driving an action from the map to that bar chart. Let's build it. So this is essentially just two different worksheets put together. To build the left side, we'll go down to the bottom of the screen and go to a new sheet. And we'll build a bar chart that shows the value of the structures in the town. Here we can just take the value of structures pill and double click it. And again, Tableau automatically knows that what I might want is a bar chart. Now we'll make that map. Again, we'll go to the bottom of the screen, click new worksheet, and then here we'll take geom and put that on the view. Now we can't quite see what just happened here because the color of those building footprints kind of blends in with the background map. And again, as we saw before, we're gonna wanna use a different background map to best show these buildings. Luckily for me, Jim has already loaded in that map box map into Tableau. Again, we'll go to the top of the screen, click map, background maps, and in this case, Lafitte Ring Levy is the one that we want. So now we can see the orange line represents that potential levy that was gonna be built, and all the building footprints are located inside the levy as little dots in this view. Now one thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is disaggregate all of those building footprints so I, so I can individually select them. And to do that, I'll go to the top left corner of the screen and grab the ID field and put that onto detail. And this tells Tableau that each one of these building footprints has a separate ID and is therefore a different building. Now one thing that we also know is that we wanna use a selection of the areas of these buildings to drive that action that we showed before. So to make that happen, we'll go to the top left part of the view and drag area onto detail to put that onto the view. Because as we saw before with the URL action, in order to use an action in Tableau, the right field has to be somewhere on the view. Now in this particular case, we're gonna use a brand new feature in Tableau that's coming out in 2018.3 called set actions to drive that selection analysis. So to do that, we'll go back to sheet five, which was that bar chart, and we'll actually make a set out of area. So we'll right click, go to create, set. In this case, we can retitle it uh, area set. And we're gonna to wanna to make sure that all of the different areas of all the building footprints are somewhere in this set. And we'll click OK. Now the last step here is to make that dashboard to connect the views together. So we'll go to the bottom of the screen and click New Dashboard. And we'll drag on the sheets that we wanna have on our view. In this case, sheet five is that bar chart and sheet six is gonna be that map. And we can even change the size of the dashboard here to make it fill up the entire screen. This doesn't look quite right, so maybe I'll reformat that just a little bit to make it easier to see. Cool, we're almost there. Finally, we wanna configure that action to drive that selection. We'll go to the top of the screen, click Dashboard, Actions, Add Action, and the new thing here in Tableau is this fifth option, which is Change Set Values. Let's use that. In this case, we again want to select the source sheet, which here is going to be sheet six in the back, which is the sheet with the map on it. So we'll make sure that that one is the one that is selected. We'll, hap we'll make it happen on selection action. And finally, we'll set the data set and the correct set. And click OK. So now what we've done is we've made a viz that has selection as the primary analysis tool. So as I select any subset of these buildings, well, that shouldn't happen. 
Ah, yes, what I forgot to do here was tell Tableau how to color this bar chart, right? I made the set, but Tableau has no idea what to do with that set. Mm -hmm. So what I have to do is take that area set and put that on the color. So now Tableau knows what to do. So we'll go back to this dashboard, and if we did this properly, we can now see the selection appear on the bar chart. Now in this case, this appears inverted. We want to see the blue part uh, as the part that we selected, so we can change that as well. We'll go back to that bar chart and simply go to the top right corner of the screen and reverse that selection. So now if I go back to the dashboard, we can see that Tableau has colored the bar chart in an easy to understand manner. Cool. So overall, um, this isn't really meant to be a story of doom and gloom, as Jim, shed, Jim said. And it's not meant to be any kind of statement you know, for or against some kind of government or political entity. But rather what we've done is show that everyone, right, not just big companies, but also small communities and people like you, me, and Jim, can use Tableau, data, and teamwork to tell the stories that matter. And that's our challenge for you today, right, is find that story that matters, find the data, and make it happen. And when you do, send it our way. Uh, we would honestly love to see it. Thanks, guys. That's it.